everyone loves crossover stories, whether it's superheroes, or Muppets, or detectives. The closest we ever got to a true Agatha Christie crossover was the Poirot novel Cards on the Table. Yeah, I know, but that doesn't really... I'll talk about that some other time. However, movie adaptations offer fresh opportunities for crossovers. Margaret Rutherford twice appeared in stories originally starring Poirot, who had been replaced by Miss Marple. She also made a cameo in an actual Poirot film. But when Geraldine McEwen took over the role in the 2000s, it was decided that Miss Marple should, for the first time, star alongside another recurring Agatha Christie detective. Just not the one we were hoping for. Tommy and Tuppence Beresford, the married crime-fighting couple, were first introduced in 1922. They appeared in four novels and one collection of short stories. Their shtick is more counter-espionage than crime-solving, but they usually end up doing both. Their banter is similar to that of Nick and Nora Charles, another married detective duo of roughly the same era, but their relationship is much more balanced, with a healthy distribution of respect and true partnership. "'Shall I neglect you a little?' suggested Tommy. "'Take other women to nightclubs, that sort of thing.' "'Useless,' said Tuppence. "'You would only meet me there with other men.' Poirot and Miss Marple's exact ages are left ambiguous over the course of their series spanning several decades, but Tommy and Tuppence seem to age in real time. In their first book, they're in their early twenties. In their last, published in 1973, they're much, much older. The story we're going to focus on today is their fourth book, published in 1968, By the Pricking of My Thumbs.' By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicky this way comes. Tommy and Tuppence go to visit Tommy's Aunt Ada at Sunny Ridge, a home for elderly women. Possible foreshadowing occurs in a comment of Ada's that anyone could enter posing as a doctor, and if an old lady called him out as an impostor or criminal, no one would pay any attention, because most of the ladies are making similar accusations every day. Tuppence meets another resident named Mrs. Lancaster, who seems to mistake Tuppence for someone else when she asks her, Excuse me. It wasn't your poor child. No. I don't think so. She starts rambling about something, or someone, behind the fireplace, claiming no one believed what she'd told them. But Tuppence leaves before discovering what Mrs. Lancaster is talking about. Aunt Ada dies in her sleep a few weeks later, and when Tommy and Tuppence go back to Sunny Ridge to sort through her possessions, they learn some disturbing things. Another resident and friend of Aunt Ada's, a Mrs. Moody, has also just died, of thrombosis, apparently. Mrs. Lancaster was suddenly removed from Sunny Ridge by the Johnsons, who had been paying for her stay there. Before leaving, Mrs. Lancaster gave to Aunt Ada a painting of a certain house, which Tuppence is sure she's seen before. One unusual thing about this book is that even though there's been a murder, that of Mrs. Moody, we don't learn that her death is murder until much later in the story. Overcome with an instinct of danger that she can't explain, Tuppence tries everything she can think of to locate Mrs. Lancaster, and fails. As Tommy leaves for a trip abroad, Tuppence resolves to find the old lady and save her from, well, from whatever the danger might be. The film starts us off with a flashback. Twenty-two years prior, a town searches for a child who's gone missing. The other children believe she was stolen by a witch. Then, with a fast forward, we're introduced to Tommy and Tuppence Beresford, played by Anthony Andrews and Greta Scacchi. And right away we see drastic changes. Firstly, yes, Tommy and Tuppence did have three children, but they were two girls and one boy. I was approached to join the service at the same time as him. I was having our first child. Nope. The two oldest children, Derek and Deborah, are twins. I know it's not germane to the story, but it's like saying Poirot is from Quebec. Tommy and Tuppence themselves have been altered in character. Sort of. Tommy is a bit crabby in the book, and Tuppence does like to drink, but in the film, these aspects of their personalities have been made proportionally over the top. As a result, Tommy has become a patronizing ass, and Tuppence is an alcoholic. It's jarring for someone familiar with their stories to see Tommy haranguing Tuppence about making him late, whining about having to drive, and then... Do you really want to come in, darling? I could take that. And if she's in one of her moods, you know how she can be. Anyway, they go to visit Aunt Ada, who is as irascible as in the book. You get rid of those cakes! You never had the intelligence for this kind of thing. 
Tuppence seems to take the comment more personally here, foreshadowing a change in her motivation for investigating the mystery, to prove Ada wrong. As she goes downstairs, we see a familiar face. I was looking for Miss Packard's office. It's on the ground floor. Ah, the quickest way is the back stairs. After Ada dies, instead of her instinct and her thirst for adventure, Tuppence is guided by something a little more concrete. I believe there's a murderer at large. Mrs. Lancaster is not safe. So in this version of the story, Ada is the one who's murdered, not Mrs. Moody. Tommy is already out of the country, so Tuppence begins investigating on her own, and finds someone else already investigating the disappearance of Mrs. Lancaster. I'm Jane Marple. Book Tuppence remembers she saw the house in the painting years ago from a passing train. After hours of driving around and searching, she finally finds it in the middle of nowhere, the house has been divided in two. The front half is unlived in, but in the back half live Alice and Amos Perry. They don't know who owns the front half. They hear a bird trapped in a chimney, so they go into the front half to free it. With the bird comes a doll that has been hidden in the chimney for who knows how long. Creepy. In the nearby village, Tuppence meets several locals, including the vicar, a busybody named Miss Bly, and Miss Copley, who runs a bed and breakfast. She learns a dizzying amount of village history. There used to be a prominent family called the Warrenders, who have since died out. The painting was done by a man with a colorful personality, Boscowan. Both he and Amos Perry were suspects twenty years ago when a slew of child murders struck the town, though Mrs. Copley half suspects the culprit was Sir Philip Stark. Apparently, he was so fond of children, he often stopped them in the street and gave them sweets. Ugh. Also, his wife ran off very suddenly around the same time as the murders, and died soon after. Did she discover Philip was the killer, and have to be silenced? Tuppence helps the vicar to locate a certain child's grave, that of Lily Waters. Just as she finds it, someone knocks her unconscious. At this point, the story switches to Tommy's perspective as he returns and tries to locate his wife. He takes the picture to an art expert, which eventually after tedious conversations that waffle on and on, leads him to the house's location. He also discovers a hidden note left for him by Aunt Ada. By the time he catches up with Tuppence, he's learned two important things. One, that Mrs. Moody was poisoned with an overdose of morphine after she recognized a criminal at Sunny Ridge. And two, that the house in the painting is one of several in various rural towns near London that are being used as storage locations for stolen goods by an organized gang of robbers. Perhaps Tuppence, and Mrs. Lancaster, got too close to their operation? Together, Tommy and Tuppence begin to make breakthrough discoveries. Someone other than Boscowan added to the painting a boat named Water Lily, perhaps as a message to direct someone to the grave of Lily Waters, where the buried coffin is actually filled with stolen loot. Lily's father had asked the vicar to find her grave, but it turns out it was actually the robber gang, who had lost track of her grave due to local vandalism. The doll hidden in the chimney contains a cache of diamonds, which apparently provides enough evidence to start bringing down the robber gang. Alice Perry probably knew what was going on in the front half of her house, but because her husband Amos had been suspected of the child murders, the robber gang somehow had a hold on her. Tuppence comes to the conclusion that Miss Packard, the head of Sunny Ridge, is part of this criminal organization, and everything she'd said about Mrs. Lancaster's departure was a complete lie. But then she remembers a letter she glimpsed earlier, which mentioned a Mrs. York at another home for elderly ladies. Making the connection to the War of the Roses, she realizes the person responsible for Mrs. Lancaster's disappearance is the person to whom the letter belonged, Miss Bly. Miss Bly is also the person who knocked Tuppence unconscious. The question remains, did Miss Bly simply transfer Mrs. Lancaster, or did she also kill her? As the book itself makes clear, this is a very complicated story. The film simplifies things by doing away with the robber gang plot thread. Also, interestingly, many of the book elements that are kept are rearranged such that it's the same story told differently. Tuppence suspects Miss Packard right away, but Miss Marple steers her back on course. It's Miss Marple who brings in an art expert, who identifies parts of the painting not put there by the artist and directs them to the house's location. Except they don't find the house when they reach the village. In fact, they won't find it till the end of the film. I like the relationship that quickly develops between Tuppence and Miss Marple.
You haven't got the map the wrong way up again, have you? I ask politely. No. I respond. They also don't meet the Parries, not directly. They see someone wearing a witch's hat, just as Tuppence first saw her in the book. Hannah, the film's counterpart to Mrs. Copley, says Alice wore the hat in a stage play and liked it so much she always keeps it on now. In the book, Alice is about to be a witch in a play. We'll see a lot of these little variations throughout the film. Instead of multiple child murders, there was only the one child murder, which is somewhat of a relief, that of Lily Waters. Her father, Dr. Waters, still lives in the village with his surviving daughter, Rose. Rose is the center of a love triangle between police constable Ethan and American soldier Chris. Miss Bly is given the first name Nellie. People in the book called her Nellie Bly, but her first name was actually Gertrude. In the film, she's married to the vicar, whose name is Septimus Bly, and is played by Charles Dance. I was intrigued by the fact that the book contains a description that sounds a lot like Charles Dance's character, but it's actually describing Sir Philip Stark. How old was he, she wondered. Seventy at least, perhaps older. A worn, ascetic face. Yes, definitely ascetic. Very definitely a tortured face. Those large, dark eyes the emaciated body, a haunted man. Hannah turns out to be a cousin of Ada's. She says Ada spent time in the village years ago, hinting that Ada recognized the house in the painting, as well as someone she'd met. Tuppence and Miss Marple discover the car that was used to take Mrs. Lancaster from Sunny Ridge. It belongs to Sir Philip Stark, who says it was stolen that night, presumably for fun by some American soldiers. Sir Philip isn't quite as creepy as he's implied to be in the book, but it's established that he's always doted on children. It's said that his own child was stillborn, and its mother died soon after, but leading up to it he spent a fortune in preparation for the child's arrival. Later we'll find out that the house in the painting was a playhouse built by Sir Philip, not a real house. Tommy returns and is predictably unreceptive and querulous when Tuppence tells him what's been going on. Your wife is right in that there is a real possibility that Ada was murdered at Sunny Ridge and Mrs. Lancaster abducted by someone in this village. Would you go away, please, and put my wife back on the line? With no robber gang hogging the plot, the story is able to delve more deeply into the mystery of Lily Waters' death. Septimus Bly is much more closely connected to the business than he was in the book, making for a very interesting character. The way Charles Dance portrays him, he's one of my favorites. The Good Samaritan. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Bloody do-gooder. Septimus. Well, he was, wasn't he? In the film, Alice and Amos Perry are mother and son, rather than husband and wife. Septimus says that Lily's murder was blamed on Amos's brother Job, who was mentally unstable, just as Amos is in the book. Job eventually hanged himself, accounting for the rope on the tree added to the painting. The bird in the chimney finally makes its appearance, bringing with it the creepy-ass doll. But there aren't any diamonds. Instead... This is a warning. Someone's trying to scare us. They're getting very close. After Tommy joins the ladies, they discover that Nellie Bly was the one who took Mrs. Lancaster from Sunny Ridge, and has been shepherding her from home to home, alternating between the names York and Lancaster, which was hinted at by the roses in the painting, added by Mrs. Lancaster herself. It seems Nellie Bly is the murderer. Until she's found dead. Poisoned. In the book, Tuppence goes to interrogate Alice Perry, but who should she find in the house but Mrs. Lancaster? Mrs. Lancaster is staying in the front of the house, but she shows Tuppence a secret passage connecting the two halves, explaining what she meant by the child behind the fireplace. It was she who had abducted the children, brought them to this house, and killed them. The boat added to the painting bore her stage name of Waterlily. As a dancer, she'd had an abortion at the age of 17, but then, after her marriage, she felt guilty about it and believed she needed to provide her dead child with companions. She also acted as a paid assassin during her tenure as part of the robber gang. Her real name is Julia Stark, wife of Sir Philip Stark. Philip discovered his wife's homicidal mania and did his best to cover it up. He was assisted by Miss Bly, who was devoted to him, which they kept in the film. When Mrs. Lancaster first met Tuppence, she mistook her for the mother of one of the children she'd killed. 
Mrs. Lancaster tries to murder Tuppence, but is thwarted at the last minute, so she commits suicide. Mercifully, the movie's denouement isn't so over the top. Septimus, it turns out, has known the dark truth all along, but could never say anything without incriminating himself for his part in it. Unable to live with his guilt any longer, he confesses, up to a point. Miss Marple helps out with the rest. When she wrote, Mrs. Lancaster is not safe, what she had meant was not that Mrs. Lancaster was in danger, but that Mrs. Lancaster was the danger. In this version of the story, Julia Stark had a miscarriage, and this, along with her pre-existing mental instability, led to her kidnapping and killing a child. Why did you kill her? Why should my baby die and the common child live? At the end of the film, Tommy and Tuppence seem to be on better terms, though Tommy has shown no signs that he's going to be less of an ass. However, after a short pep talk from Miss Marple, Tuppence at least seems to have more self-confidence. It's hard to tell whether this adaptation is on the loose side or not. All the most important elements from the book are still there. They're just presented differently. It reminds me of the 21st century version of the Sherlock Holmes story, A Study in Scarlet. But loose or not, as an adaptation it works rather well. Not as an adaptation of a Tommy and Tuppence story, because this Tommy and Tuppence are not in any sense book accurate, but with regard to its source material. The book starts out interestingly, but the story gets more vague and convoluted the farther you go, and having the characters comment on how muddled it is doesn't make this more palatable. The film managed to reshape the plot without altering the core arc, and adding Miss Marple didn't detract from it, probably because this time they restricted her to the role of mentor. The protagonist remained who it was meant to be. Personally, I find this a decent, enjoyable film. It may not be the best way to introduce your friends to Tommy and Tuppence, but then again, it won't spoil said introduction. There's also a French adaptation of this book, Mon Petit Doigt Madi, which I've yet to try. In fact, I still have to catch up with the other recent Tommy and Tuppence miniseries. This won't be the last time I talk about the Beresfords. See you soon!